Good morning. My name is Kate Stewart. I'm a director here at the Linux Foundation. And I'd like to take this opportunity to give you a bit of a feel for what's coming down and some of the next steps that are emerging on improving the software transparency and our dependability of the whole software ecosystem. Um, I don't think it's any surprise to any of you guys that open source is the foundation for innovation. Um, we've been seeing most of the code bases, pretty much, um, pretty much all the software that's out there does have some open source in it. And um, from the Black Ducks analysis this year, over 70% of their audited code bases actually are open source code bases. Um, and from some of Sonatype's work, um, they've seen double and triple digit growth in open source components and no slowdown in sight. And all you have to do is look at the um, number of repos up on GitHub and watch them going up and out to the right. There's no slowdown in sight. There's lots of components out there. They're doing lots of really cool things and that's what's fueling the innovation. However, the challenge is uh, when you have all that software and it's all been assembled together, how do you know what's really inside? Um, that is becoming more and more um, challenging to figure out uh, with containers, um, with people deploying that way, with people working up in the cloud. Um, the, the, you know, a lot of things done on IoT device. There's lots of different pieces of software that are coming together to make these wonderful solutions. However, do we know they're all the pieces and have we been able to identify the right ones that um, may have some risks or vulnerabilities associated with them so that we can mitigate. One of the key technologies that's emerging here is something called the Software Bill of Materials or an SBOM. Um, this is a way of basically identifying the key components in your software that you're running and the relationship between these components. Uh, at the heart of it is just basically, you know, an identifier of that software and the relationships between that component and its dependencies um, and some other information like these dependencies could be a library, it could be modules, um, they could be open source, they could be proprietary, they could be free, they could be paid for, you know, you know, the software ecosystem has all of these components in them and we need to start to have more transparency about how they're being used. So who should use an SBOM? Well, pretty much everyone. <laughs> um, anyone who's really caring about um, improving their ability to support their software and support their customers and um, being visible about using SBOMs and um, is effective for differentiating in the marketplaces as well. Um, it helps you with your legal um, obligations with regards to open source as well as proprietary, but also there's contractual terms that may be included. You may want to be able to query exactly which components you're using so you can adhere to those. And for vulnerabilities, you want to know what's there so you can understand whether or not you've got to mitigate or not. So when um, should it be used in an organization? Well, pretty much anywhere through the development lifecycle and deployment lifecycle for that matter. Um, we've got a lot of open source and we've got a lot of, you know, executables out there that are running our modern infrastructure and being able to accurately identify which ones are there as well as um, what's been tested, what's not been tested. These are the whole pieces of the puzzle we need to start getting our hands around and be able to track real time. So how are we going to do this? Big question always, right? Um, we need to have some common processes and norms. We need to have common data formats. And um, we need to have tooling to automate this because the amount of information here is just staggering. It's completely overwhelming. So we need to start figuring out how can we automate this and make it all available. At the Linux Foundation, um, we've got a variety of projects that um, we're working on um, that have been helping with these elements. Um, the first of which is OpenChain, um, which has started about five years ago. Then there's SPDX, which started about 10 years ago because we wanted to exchange this information. And then the last year we've started working on um, trying to get that tooling and automation missing piece better in place. So OpenChain's project mission was to, you know, establish what requirements companies can expect of each other and build the trust between companies and organizations for managing this open source and for that matter, any software that they're sharing. And so as the collateral is being developed, um, we've got the ability to um, establish what the norms are of expectations and figure out how to signal that, you know, this is a trusted partner in your supply chain that you understand they know what they're doing. 
And that's what Open Shame was for, focused on at the heart. Um, what it's trying to do is make sure what's coming in from upstream, you bring into your organization, you've got training policies, processes in place, such that when you move it, um, send it downstream or you know back up to outside of your organization, you release something from your organization, um, you have a reasonable flow and you have been able to articulate it. At the heart of it, there's an open chain specification. Um, this is a very short specification, it's about 10 pages. Um, we just finished, um, we're in the last stages of our ISO submission, and so it may become a formal standard in the, next, in the near future. Um, we've also, it's been developed with a broad range of corporations, and it's already been translated by volunteers in the community to, um, to Chinese, Japanese, Korean, Portuguese, um, Spanish, Italian, Polish, and German. And if you don't see a language there that you uh, speak and you want to help the project, they would welcome more translations. Um, another key part of what's being effective for Open Chain is having a lot of um, reference material available for people who are trying to figure out how to use this. Um, we've got a fair amount of, um, it started off, we've got a fair amount of use cases already defined right now. Um, these are there, and then we've also got uh, support happening from um, like Pricewaterhouse or two are doing certifications and at the heart there was a right from the start there's been this training material that we've had um, and so that came from a whole bunch of companies sharing their internal training materials and making it available to the product project uh, to um, in a neutral fashion so that, that other people have a basic understanding of what the concepts were being meant and had training they could use internally and reuse inside. Um, this is then useful for, for open chain that you can go after a self certification and basically answer an online free online questionnaire about your practices internally understand where you are you can make it public or not you don't have to. And if you do want to make it public and you've got um, you answer all the questions appropriately. Um, then you can get your open chain certification badge and use that and display that for your organization. Um, we've got a large number of corporate corporations um, basically displaying their open chain certification and you can find out more about this on the website. Next step of how is, okay, what's the data format? How do we exchange this? What's, what's the details? <laughs> and here the SPDX actually can satisfy by identifying the components as well as the relationships and we've got that. So um, this standard was uh, created um, pretty much designed for creating the component metadata information associated with software. And there's the relationships are already a part of it. So you can articulate the full dependency trees and um, how the information is coming together and being used. Um, the charter for the project was to set up this data exchange and basically be able to, you know, have software package metadata and uh, support the software supply chain processes. So, that's what the project was 10 years ago when we started and there's been more and more use cases over time. And so there's more and more things that we can represent in there. And one of the key parts for this one is the fact that it's got an underlying model which supports the various file formats. And that model lets us basically take a document in one format, like human readable like a spreadsheet and then translate it to one of the other ones. And recently we've just finished adding in JSON YAML and there's an XML variant there now too for us to uh, work with. And then the last piece is, okay, how do we get that common tooling available? How do we get that ready to use? And um, in the last year, we've just started off ACT, and that's letting us looking at the automating the compliance tooling. And so where we want to use YesPalm obviously is all stages. And so we need to have reference tooling to work with all these different stages for the effective exchange. And we want to be able to support various use cases like compliance, security, export control, pedigree, and provenance workflows. And so that's the information we need to carry forward and we need to be able to track it through this ecosystem. Now, reference tools like, okay, I want a tool that does what I want. Well, there's actually a whole bunch of people who want things for specific purposes. And so um, we've come up with a categorization as part of the NTA work um for um what type of tool it is and are you authoring it during a build or are you authoring it after creation are you consuming an sbomb and doing a view or diff and analyze or are you trying to transform one from one format to another or merge a bunch of them together um as their libraries apis and so forth so there's a lot of tooling that's potentially needed here and um actually for most of the workflows um 
this, if we can start to satisfy that, we should be getting close to um, letting people customize as they need to. Um, the ACT projects, um, ACT is an umbrella and there's a variety of open source projects underneath it and they've all agreed to uh, work with the common standard of SPDX and some of the tools let you author during a build, others let you author after creation and then some of them let you consume and transform. So this starts to cover that flow that we're looking at here of, you know, different workflow, different cases. So some of these tools are very po powerful in amongst themselves. Um, the projects are all available um, online, up on publicly available. Anyone can go look at them, start to work with them. And um, if you need any help finding them, I'm happy to direct and help you connect up with any of the key people in this. So just to conclude, um, Adopting an SBOM is a good thing to do. There's a lot of benefits um, and figuring out what formats you want to be using and how you want to do it is obviously going to depend on your own organizations. But um, it, benefits are there for pretty much anyone who's developing software and those it will help speed up the uh, consideration from the developer perspective, from the business perspective and from the legal perspective. So um, hopefully the executives are happy. Um, and so anyone who's offering software and, or using it and student should be starting to ask for it. So with that, I'll just say thank you. And if you've got any questions about any of the mentioned projects, please feel free to reach out. Thank you very much.